is the earnest, passionate prayer of my heart that today you would see the foundation upon which your hope is built. In Romans chapter nine, we see God's sovereign work through his promise to Abraham to bring about the nation of Israel through whom would come the Christ. And if today, my skeptical friend, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, Romans 10, nine says you will be saved. This is a heavily theological chapter of the Bible, and as a result, this sermon's going to be heavily theological. There are some false teachings that are coming from this chapter that I will address, and this may make you feel a little bit left out. I apologize. I don't want you to feel left out. I, I, you, you remember when you were a little kid, you went to your friend's house, and his dad walked in wearing like the standard issue, dad, white, New Balance tennis shoes, and he had like a family meeting, and so you kind of stepped to the side in your Power Rangers t-shirt and like kind of awkwardly rocked back and forth and looked at your... You know, it played with the Indiglo button on your Timex Iron Man triathlon watch, which is all you could really do with it because smart watches wouldn't be invented for another 25 years. But eventually the family meeting would end and he'd invite you to the table and you guys would have one of those Sicilian style pizzas that Pizza Hut used to make. Do you remember that? This could be a little bit like that, but my prayer is that you would hear the gospel's foundations through this text. And, and maybe if you've come upon one of those like awkward, hostile debates between Christians on the internet about this chapter that you'd have some questions answered by the ultimate authority, which is scripture itself. Highlands Community Church, if you've never really studied theology before, then here in Romans chapter nine, for the next week's time, you're likely to be a Calvinist. Happy Calvinist week. What I wanna encourage you to do though, is consider the larger arc of the complete thought of what Paul is teaching. The arc begins in chapter eight, and then reaches its completion in chapter 11. At Highlands Community Church, we've never exclusively endorsed Reformed theology or Calvinism. We do have some elders on our elder board who are Calvinists, we have others who are not. We're a non-denominational church, and for decades here, people of various soteriologies, meaning studies of how Christians are made, have stood shoulder to shoulder worshiping God. We have Molinists in our church. We have Amaraldians in our church. We have Calvinists in our church. We have a few hyper-Calvinists, and we love them too. We have some Arminians in our church. Within these, Arminianism, especially because of the fifth article of remonstrance, kind of the founding document for Arminianism proper, because that document gets really squishy when it comes to the assurance of salvation, that particular belief within traditional Arminianism proper would fall outside of the scope of the historic teachings of Highlands Community Church. Nonetheless, there are members of Highlands Community Church, beloved members of the family of God, who would hold to and consider themselves Arminians. So as we do this, there are some things about Calvinism to be considered. Calvinism is named for the Reformed theologian and, uh, and the reformer John Calvin. His followers at the Synod of Dort gave the five points of Calvinism. They are abbreviated with the acronym TULIP, T-U-L-I-P. The T stands for total depravity. U, unconditional election. L, limited atonement. I, irresistible grace. And P, perseverance of the saints. Here's where Calvinism fits on the larger spectrum of the soteriologies that we've introduced so far. Last week we introduced Molinism, which is really built heavily around the foreknowledge of God. You'll see that Molinism falls right in the middle of the spectrum under what's called synergism. What does that word mean? This is to describe the two energies at work in salvation. The Holy Spirit of God draws upon somebody to be saved, and then man believes and is saved. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, the ends of the spectrum, you have Arminianism and Calvinism, but they, they, they both say monergism. So what's the deal, Campbell? What are you talking about? Within Calvinism, the electing work of God is completely, all that energy is exerted on God's part alone. So God reaches down and decides who is saved and who isn't. Now, in some sense, on the other end of the spectrum, in Arminianism, it's also monergistic, meaning all the energy is coming from one party, and that is man deciding to be saved. Now, in fairness to Arminianism, Article 3 of the Articles of Remonstrance does describe man as dead in his sin and uh, uh, incapable of doing any good apart from God. But, technically speaking, Arminianism would likewise be a form of monergism, just the converse of the monergism described in Calvinism. Amaraldinism will introduce later on. 
You can also see that along this spectrum, we have open theism to determinism to fatalism. Some extreme forms of Arminianism would hold to what's called open theism. This is a false teaching that we rebuked last week on the basis of the text of Romans chapter 8. Determinism, this is more the idea that God has the sovereign right to determine some things to happen. Evil will happen permissibly, but even then, God is able to work it together according to his good and pleasing and perfect will. Fatalism, on the other hand, would make God also the author of chaos. That would make God not only sovereign over the events of Eden, but sovereign over the events that take place today, like mass shootings, for example. And these bring up some biblical questions to answer. Hyper-Calvinism, today I'll address as the belief that all the world is a bunch of Jacobs and Esau's, and God loves the Jacobs and hates the Esau's. I'm going to disprove that by reading my Bible, by practicing basic hermeneutics, not only on Romans chapter 9, but on the passages that Paul references in Romans chapter 9. When he quotes Genesis 25, we'll read Genesis 25. When he quotes Malachi 1, we'll, we'll go to Malachi 1. When he quotes Hosea, we'll read it. Th this is basic first semester seminary training on hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the, the process of understanding what scripture originally meant and was originally intended to say and then applying it properly in today's context. Paul, writing under the inspiration of the same Holy Spirit who inspired Malachi, is not going to contradict Malachi. Writing under the same inspiration of the same Holy Spirit who gave Genesis to Moses, he's not going to contradict what God intended when he inspired this message to Moses. So we're going we're gonna to just take a radical approach and we're going to read those little funny footnotes in your Bible. By doing that, we're going to see what was originally intended in the scriptures that Paul quotes. And as a result, my hope is that we will give biblical clarity to what Romans 9 actually says. That's my endeavor today. All right, personally, technically, I wouldn't call myself a Calvinist, really. I hold to the doctrine of election, but strictly speaking, I wouldn't fit within Calvinism. There is a prevalent false teaching that I will refer to as hyper-Calvinism that I have heard with my own ears and seen with my own eyes. It's growing in popularity. It's prominent. I believe it's harmful for the church. And so I wish to, just on the basis of expositing Romans 9, show this to be an unbiblical notion. As we address this further, I, I hope that you do come to fully acknowledge the sovereignty of God. Do you understand that it is a sovereign right to choose Israel over Edom. Let's read Romans chapter 9 and endeavor to understand exactly what the Holy Spirit intended and see how it applies to us today because it does quite beautifully. Based on what God did through Israel today, you can call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Here's the text. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies to me through the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off, meaning literally an anathema, from Christ for the benefit of my brothers and sisters, my own flesh and blood. May we never forget that Romans chapter 9 opens up with Paul's heartfelt, sincerely, sincerely, intensely felt anguish that he wishes he could forgo his own salvation if that meant that his fellow Israelites could be saved. Do you, have you ever loved anybody so much that you would go to hell for them if it meant they could go to heaven? Jesse, how do you know he's talking about the Israelites? Look at verse four. They are the Israelites. And to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple service, and the promises. By adoption, I believe he means God's adoption of Israel as his chosen nation. Now, this is not the universal salvation of all of Israel. That'll become very clear as we continue in Romans chapter nine. By the glory, I believe he means the Shekinah glory described in Ezekiel, or uh, rather, rather uh, Exodus 16, 10, and Exodus 24, 16 through 17, and 29, 42 through 43, and Leviticus 9, 23. When he describes the covenants, there are various covenants throughout redemptive history. The Adamic covenant, the covenant with Adam, the Noahic covenant, the covenant with, with Noah, the Mosaic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, the covenant with the priests in Numbers 25, 1 through 10. The new covenant prophesied in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34, Ezekiel 37, 26, and Hebrews 8, verses 6 through 13. Of these covenants, only the, only the Adamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant 
were temporary in nature. All the others are eternal in their scope. So these are the covenants that were given to Israel. They also were given the law. This is God literally giving the Ten Commandments, the law of God, to Israel. On stone tablets written with his own finger. See our studies in Numbers and Deuteronomy. The temple service. This describes the ceremonial acts of worship prescribed in the Torah. The promises. I believe this speaks of all the promises for the Messiah who would come one day. All of these promises, according to 2 Corinthians 1.20, find their yes in Jesus. The ancestors are theirs. That's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And from them, by physical descent, came the Christ, who is God over all, praised forever. Amen. Because of God's election of Israel, the Christ comes about. And today, if you, by the Holy Spirit of God, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. So the fireworks go off just five verses in. Romans chapter 9 is obviously about Israel. Here's verse 6. Now it is not as though the word of God has failed, because not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Neither are all of Abraham's children his descendants. On the contrary, your offspring will be traced through Isaac. That is, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but the children of the promise who are considered the offspring. So here he's just quoted Genesis 21, 12. You can see that God's election of Israel was at work from the very foundations. It was not the children whom Abraham fathered with Hagar and Keturah. God took care of Hagar. He took care of Ishmael. These were his children of physical descent, but no, that that whole story came about because Sarah and Abraham wanted to try to short circuit the promises of God. They, they knew that they were getting well along in age and having a son seemed less and less likely. So Sarah said, here, father a child through my handmaiden. She ended up despising Hagar and Ishmael and discarding them. So God has to look after them. It wasn't the children to the physical descent of Abraham. It's not an ethnocentric covenant. It's a promise of God. So it was the promise of God that brought about the miraculously Miraculously late in life conceived Isaac. This is the one through whom the promise would be born. And then in the next generation, it would not be the firstborn of the two fraternal twins, but the second. God decided before Jacob and Esau were even born, before they had done anything right or wrong, there are huge implications to that in the theology of this infant salvation, right? See our teachings on Aden's hope. God decided before they were born that the older would serve the younger. This is just to prove that he's the one in control of his chosen nation. Look at verse nine. For this is the statement of the promise. At this time, I will come and Sarah will have a son, quoting Genesis 18. And not only that, but Rebekah conceived children through one man, our father Isaac. For though her sons had not been born yet or done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to election might stand, not from works, but from the one who calls. Remember, throughout this chapter, as you're gonna see later on in the text in verse 32, Israel's been trying to pursue salvation as if it were by works. This is not because of works. It's just by the grace of God. It's by the calling of God. Not based on, not at all, not at all based on anything that they had done, not by works, but by the one who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. This quotes Genesis 25, verse 23. Now we're gonna go back and read Genesis 25, verse 23, but at first I wanna read the next verse. This could be the most controversial verse in the entire Bible. As it is written, I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. What immediately preceded this? It was Genesis 25, 23, in which God told Rebekah, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples will come from you and be separated. One people will be stronger and the older will serve the younger. The hyper-Calvinistic teaching of this passage is that the whole world is comprised of Jacobs and Esau's and God loves the Jacobs and hates the Esau's. I contend that Jacob refers to Israel and Esau refers to Edom. The prevalent response that I've received to that interpretation is, yeah, but Jesse, that's more people. God hating Esau means God hating one person. When really the hyper-Calvinistic bent is that we're all a bunch of Jacobs or Esau's, which means that God loves just the Jacobs. And I agree, narrow is the gate and few find it. 
but he hates all the Esau's? That extends hatred of God upon the majority of all the people who have ever existed in human history and ever will exist until the second coming of Christ. Now, I want to be clear that I'm not arguing from incredulity here. My bride and I know firsthand exactly what it is like to see God have one plan for one of your fraternal twins and a very different plan for the other fraternal twin. My hyper-Calvinist friend, do not misconstrue one's refusal to adhere to your soteriology for emotional weakness, a disrespect of scripture, a downplaying of the sovereignty of God, or an emotional incapacity to concede to the sovereignty of God. I know exactly what it's like to see God have one will for one twin and another for the other twin. Fully prepared, and I've already been down this road and accepted it myself. Rather, it is on clear biblical grounds that I contend. Jacob represents Israel. Esau represents Edom. To begin, Jacob's name was literally changed to Israel. Esau's name was literally interchangeable with Edom. See Genesis 36, verse 19. God wrestled with Jacob and changed his name to Israel right before, in fact, he met with Esau, Genesis 32 and 33. When we arrive at these words, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated, let's practice elementary, basic Bible reading skills. Let's see what Paul just quoted. Paul, writing under the inspiration of the exact same Holy Spirit, the exact same Holy Spirit, that inspired the book of Malachi is not going to contradict what God gave to Malachi. Surely Paul practiced basic hermeneutics and respected the inspiration of scripture based on his own firsthand experience with it. So let's see what Paul's quoting. He knew that many of his Jewish readers would have this memorized. And so by referring to it, he knew that they would likely, given their expertise, many of them having memorized Malachi, knew exactly what he was referring to. So let's go back and see what he was referring to when he says, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. What did he quote? It's Malachi 1. Here's how Malachi opens. A pronouncement, the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord. Yet you ask, how have you loved us? Wasn't Esau Jacob's brother? This is the Lord's declaration. Even so, I loved Jacob, but I hated Esau. I turned his mountain into a wasteland and gave his inheritance to to the desert jackals. Though Edom says, we have been devastated, but we will rebuild the ruins. The Lord of armies says this, they may build, but I will demolish. They will be called a wicked country and the people of the Lord is cursed forever. Your own eyes will see this and you yourselves will say, the Lord is great even beyond the borders of Israel. So in its original context, Malachi 1 was God's answer to the question, how have you loved us? He, in perfect harmony with what we see in Romans 9, shows Israel what it's like to be despised by God. How have you loved us? Consider how I've treated Edom. This is what it's like to be loved by me. Moreover, moreover, there's another entire book of the Bible that's devoted to explaining why God was opposed to the nation of Edom. The nation of Edom doesn't exist anymore. It ceased to exist about six centuries before Jesus was born. And this was all in fulfillment of what Obadiah prophesied. Nobody reads Obadiah. When I was a curriculum writer, the company I worked for had another brand where churches could order whatever they wanted to study from the Bible. And this produced a, a survey database kind of inadvertently with thousands of entries across thousands and thousands of churches. And we saw that churches love to study Acts. They love to study Revelation. They love to study the Gospels. No church in the history of that brand had ever asked us to write anything on Obadiah. Maybe if people studied Obadiah more, there'd be less debate over what God meant by Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Here's how the book of Obadiah opens. This is what the Lord God has said about Edom. We have heard a message from the Lord. An envoy has been sent among the nations. Rise up and let us go to war against her. Look, I will make you insignificant among the nations. You will be deeply despised. Your arrogant heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rock in your home on the heights who say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground? Though you seem to soar like an eagle and make your nest among the stars, even from there I will bring you down. This is the Lord's declaration. Obadiah overtly prophesies why God is opposed to the nation of Edom. So no, it is actually not more people to say that God is opposed to the nation of Edom and not just the Esau's of the world. The whole world's population thus far is estimated to be 107 billion people. Now, survey data shows that roughly a third of the population professes to follow God. 
Now, we know that it's likely far less than that because nobody's going around to all of these survey respondents and confirming, do you have the Holy Spirit of God in your life? Are you bearing fruit? Right? Do you repent from sin? So it's likely far less than a third of the population. But let's go with it because that leaves two-thirds of the world's population, if these trends were consistent across the millennia past, who have, who have not given their lives to Christ, which means they would be fit within the hyper-Calvinistic definition of an Esau hated by God. That's 70.6 billion people so far in the history of the world and counting who within the hyper-Calvinistic interpretation of Jacob I loved, Esau I hated, who have been hated by God. No, it is not more people to say that God was opposed to the nation of Edom. When we see Esau recorded in Genesis 36, he has one daughter and two sons and 12 grandkids. When he approaches Jacob, in Genesis 32 and 33, he's accompanied by an envoy of 400 men. It's reasonable to speculate that his population of his country was in the hundreds of, hundreds of thousands, but let's be incredibly ridiculously generous and call it the tens of millions. Tens of millions of people is fewer than 70.6 billion people and counting. So again, no, it is not more people to say that God is opposed to the nation of Edom than to say that God hates the lost. Concerns me deeply. I know that double predestination is an unavoidable end, a default ending drawn from both Calvinism proper and hyper-Calvinism. Double predestination is the belief that God not only elects some to be saved, but also then by default unconditionally damns everybody else. The grace of Calvinism is that God doesn't owe salvation to anybody. He's gracious to save even one of us, much less as many as we believe he has, as many as he will. So God's still gracious. But my objection to the notion that God hates the lost is based on a clear reading of what Paul intended, what Malachi intended, what Obadiah intended, what the Bible says. Here is a map of the world. This is an amalgamation of data brought together by the Southern Baptist Convention's missions arm, the International Mission Board, the world's largest missions organization. It includes as well data from the Lausanne Conference and the Joshua Project. Dots that are bright green, or dark green rather, indicate a 10% or more presence of evangelical Christianity. Lime green means less. Gray is unknown. Yellow and orangish, you get to get more hostile towards Christianity until finally the most severe opposition to Christianity is found where the red dots are. Look at the nation of India on this map. You can literally make out its borders by its lostness. Look at the southeastern United States on this map. Look at the beautiful, deep, lush green that it is. See the outer banks of Australia? See the burgeoning church within China. Praise God for that. My hyper-Calvinist friend, when you look at the map of the world, you must answer some questions biblically. Why is God opposed to, why does God hate, by your soteriology, the entire nation of India? Why does his election tend to favor wealthier white people? Why, hyper-Calvinist friend, are these dots not a heterogeneous mixture across the globe? Why is it that God favors people of certain ethnicities over others? Here's what I propose. These people in the areas that are marked by their lostness on this map are not hated by God, but they can't call upon the God they've not believed in, and they can't believe unless they hear, and they can't hear unless someone preaches to them, and they can't preach unless they're sent. I propose that Romans chapter 10 is true. I reach out to you, my hyper-Calvinist brothers, I'm gonna invite you to rally around our shared belief in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him would not die but have everlasting life. I wanna reach out to you and appeal to our shared belief in 1 Timothy 2, verses three and four. It's not God's will that they would be damned, it's God's will that all men would come to repentance. This is what God desires. When we look at this map of the world, which we'll return to next week, let us reinterpret Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. This is the present state of things. And given this reality, I suggest you take a more biblical approach to Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Remember likewise that Jacob and Esau, the men, reconciled in Genesis 33, verse five. 
Esau saw Jacob, ran to him, hugged him, wrapped his arms around him, kissed him, and they wept. Jacob and Esau reconciled. It was not because, by the way, God's, God's election of Jacob over Esau was not because of his good behavior. I mean, sure, like Esau exhibited some pretty bad behaviors. At one point, he even promised his whole inheritance over to Jacob just for a bowl of lentil soup. Paul would use this as an analogy for adultery, to give up everything that God has promised you in exchange for one moment, moment of physical satisfaction. Sure, Esau, Esau wasn't exactly a model citizen, but Jacob, at the behest of his mother, tricked his blind father into conveying that eternal blessing upon him. But in all of this, it was already predetermined by God that the older would serve the younger. The trickster Jacob would later be tricked himself by Laban. We know that God was at work, and it wasn't because Jacob deserved it. It was just so that God's purpose in electing Israel over Edom, Jacob over Esau, might stand. Let's continue in the text. What should we say then? Is there injustice with God? Absolutely not. For he tells Moses, I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Now, I've been picking on hyper-Calvinism on a biblical basis. Christians who hold to a strict Arminianism and skip over Romans chapter nine, now it's your turn. This is how God introduced himself in Exodus chapter 33. Do you realize that? Because you believe the book of Exodus, you already believe this about God. God spoke to Moses through the burning bush. Fast forward, he speaks to Moses again on Mount Sinai, giving him the Ten Commandments and passing in front of him, in front of him proclaiming his name, the Lord, in front of him, saying, I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. If you believe the book of Exodus, which you do, you believe this is already true of God. And if you, my skeptical friend, for the very first time are experiencing the compassion of God, today is the day that you are saved. Look at verse 16. So then it does not depend on human will or effort, but on God who shows mercy. Everybody of every soteriology ought to believe and agree upon this one. The only people who would dispute this are Mormons. The only people who would dispute this are people who believe in legalism. It does not depend on human will or effort, but only on God's mercy. Our righteousness is like filthy rags before God. We can do nothing, nothing at all to save ourselves. Rather, it is all totally by grace alone, through faith alone. This is not of ourselves. It is a gift of God. Not one ounce of human will or effort can save a dead sinner. Look at verse 17. For the scripture tells Pharaoh, I raised you up for this reason so that I may display my power in you and that my name may be proclaimed in the whole earth. Evidently, God succeeded in exactly what he set out to do through Pharaoh because here we are today, fast forward through all of history, the Prince of Egypt, the Mariah Carey song, we see what God did to the plagues and I'm standing on a platform in Seattle giving glory to God from the other side of the earth from where he did it. He did exactly what he set out to do. Continue in the text. So then he has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy and he hardens whom he wants to harden. Go download the Highlands Community Church app. I spent over two hours compiling a resource for us and my team worked together to make it look really presentable and beautiful. I went plague for plague, showing where every one of the plagues of Egypt took place in the Bible and why they took place. God hardened Pharaoh's heart in four out of the 10 plagues for a reason. Have you ever thought about the plagues? They weren't just arbitrary. And now for my next trick, locusts! You get locusts and you get locusts too. Rather, they were, they were to demonstrate the, the Egyptian pantheon, the, the Egyptian gods as all impotent, to, to remove the veil of Satan behind each of them to show that they were all just demons all along, that there's only one God, and that's Yahweh. So I've shown plague for plague why God would bring about the different plagues that he did. He would, he'd be brought about the plague of, of turning the water to blood to disprove Hopi, the frogs, Hecate, the gnats from the dust, Geb, the swarms of flies, Kepri, the death of the livestock, Hathor, the boils, Isis, the hail and the thunder and lightning, Nut, the locust, Seth, the darkness, Horus, or Ra, and the death of the firstborn, Pharaoh himself. In six out of the 10 plagues, the scripture says, as indicated in the resource available on our app and our social media channels right now, Pharaoh's heart was already hardened of his own volition. Now in four out of the 10 plagues, God intervenes and hardens Pharaoh's heart. Again, like the text says, God hardens whom he wants to harden. That's God's sovereign right. It's important as you consider this, though, that James 1 is still true, okay? God does not tempt us to sin. Rather, God caused Pharaoh's thoughts, thinking himself a God, to be brought forth to their logical end. And the result is 10 humiliated Egyptian gods and you and I here on the other side of the world giving glory to God. 
Indeed, because of what God did in hardening Pharaoh's heart, what he prophesied would happen came absolutely true. Now he has displayed his name and proclaimed it through the whole earth. There are examples of God hardening people's hearts like this in scripture. Look at verse 19. You will say to me, therefore, why then does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, a mere man, to talk back to God? Well, what is form? Say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Or as the potter, no right over the clay to make from the same lump one piece of pottery for honor and another for dishonor? And what if God, wanting to display his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience objects of his wrath prepared for destruction? And what if God did this to make known the riches of his glory on objects of mercy that he prepared beforehand for glory on us, the ones he also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. We see God harden Pharaoh's heart and bring about glory. We see God work through Esau even, predetermining what, what, what would happen in his life. And the ultimate result is God's glory and a clear contrast with those whom God despises, the nation of Edom. Then we see God do the same thing in Judas. We see God do the same thing in the Antichrist one day. We see God do the same thing even to the Pharisees. But all these people have something in common. Of their own volition, Esau, Pharaoh, Judas, the Pharisees, the beast in Revelation, all of them likewise have their hearts hardened of their own volition. God never hardens anyone's heart who has already not exhibited their own, their own hostility towards God. This is God's sovereign right to harden Pharaoh's heart. Who are we to talk back to God? We are mere sinful mortals. God is the one who is in control. So my Orthodox Arminian friend, you need to concede this of God. This is sovereign right, yes? Shall we meet together at scripture? This is a beautiful text because he's about to quote Hosea. And he's going to show how, according to verse 24, that it's not just about Jews, but about Gentiles. As it also says in Hosea, I will call not my people, my people, and she who is unloved, beloved. And it will be where, uh, in the place where they were told you were not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. Everything about Hosea's life was one big living testimony about God. Hosea was instructed to take his unfaithful wife back over and over again. As a result, their marriage became a picture of God taking unfaithful Israel back over and over again. Can you imagine going up in, growing up in middle school with a name, Not My People? That was one of Hosea's kids' names. His, his kids were named Not My People and My People because God did that. He took the slaves of Egypt, after hardening Pharaoh's heart, his sovereign right to do, he created his people, Israel. They were once unloved, but now they are beloved. They were once, they were once not a people, now they are sons of the living God. Here's what's so beautiful about Paul's application of this, not only to Jews, but also to Gentiles. Today, today, though you are not a people, you would be called the people of God. And though you, are, though you consider yourself unloved, you would be God's beloved. And though you are not a people, you don't feel like you're anything. Today, you would become a son or a daughter of the living God. This is true of both Jews and Gentiles. Now, from this, from this point on, he's gonna now quote, Two passages from Isaiah, but these pertain specifically to Israel. Okay, Romans chapter 9 is particularly difficult for the Orthodox Jew to read. But Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the Israelites is like the sand of the sea, see Genesis 22, only the remnant will be saved since the Lord will execute his sentence completely and decisively on the earth. Like he just wrote before, not everybody who's descended from Abraham is going to inherit Abraham. Not everybody who is descended from Israel is Israel. Only the remnant, only the elect will be saved. Oftentimes the term elect refers to converted Jews, the saved among Israel. Isaiah chapter 10 was originally aimed at corrupt Jewish priests who were saddling people down with legalistic laws that were never intended by God. And God decreed in Isaiah 10 his sentence upon them. Now, according to Romans chapter nine, God is exercising exactly what he said he would do. And his sentence is being executed decisively on the earth and completely on the earth. Now in verse 29, just as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have become like Sodom and we would have been made like Gomorrah. If it weren't for God's intervention in electing Israel, they would have been just like Sodom and Gomorrah. Consider this, verse 30. What should we say then? Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained righteousness, namely the righteousness that comes from faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not achieved the righteousness of the law. Why is that? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were by works. 
They stumble over the stumbling stone as it is written. Look, I'm putting a stone in Zion to stumble over and a rock to trip over. And the one who believes on him will not be put to shame. Romans 9 is largely about Israel. He's speaking about the Jews who tripped over Jesus. They discarded him, but now now later they look back and they see he is the cornerstone. One day in heaven, every eye will see, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Today, Orthodox Judaism is out of the will of God because they deny that Yeshua is Messiah. They deny that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. My son Austin got us called into a parent-teacher conference because he said that, but it's true. It's true. They trip over him like he's a stumbling stone, but one day in heaven they will see he is the cornerstone. They will see Jesus as the Lord. And not everybody who is descended from Abraham is going to inherit this promise. Only the remnant, only those who call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Look at at the opening of chapter 10 as a sneak peek. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God concerning them, meaning Israel, is for their salvation. I can testify about them that they have zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Since they are ignorant of the righteousness of God and have attempted to establish their own righteousness, they have not submitted to God's righteousness. For God is the end, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. In Revelation chapter seven, we see this beautiful picture. Do you remember when Jesus said, you didn't choose me, but I chose you? To whom was he speaking? The disciples. I believe everything Calvinism says is 100% true of the disciples. Jesus looked at them and said, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. It's still true today. Why were there 12 of them? Have you considered that? It's because there were 12 tribes of Israel. They were the ones in John 17 that Jesus referred to as the ones you've given me. And then in his prayer in John 17, he prays not only for them, including Judas, by the way, but now everyone who would believe because of their message. I'm so glad that God unconditionally elected John because I read his gospel as a young boy and was compelled by the Holy Spirit, drawn by the Father to be saved. I see a beautiful harmony in election and the drawing of the Spirit that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord to be saved. I have always said in every one of my gospel presentations, in Romans chapter 10, 9, it's only by the Spirit that we're even able to confess Jesus is Lord. Now that same picture of God's election making it possible for Gentiles to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved is evidence in Revelation. In Revelation 7, there's 12,000 from these tribes of Israel coming in their complete and finalized order now, beginning with the tribe of Judah, the tribe from whom came the Christ, from Judah, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. And then it doesn't stop there. It doesn't just stop there. This is so incredibly beautiful. Because of God's election of Israel, because of what God chose to do, now there are people from every language, every nation, every tribe, and every tongue who can confess that Jesus is Lord and are there proclaiming that salvation belongs to the Lord. When we come back together again, Highlands Community Church, I want you to fill every one of our seats from people from every tribe and every nation and every language and every tongue. I want you to deliberately reach across cultural lines to share the gospel with others because that's bringing heaven to earth. You want me to prove it? I will. Look at this. After this, I looked and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne, before the Lamb. And they were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne. And along with the elders and the four living creatures, they fell face down before the throne and worshiped God, saying, amen, blessing and honor and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Because of what God did through his chosen 12, he made it possible for people from every nation to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Now, everyone who calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. Aren't you grateful that God elected the nation of Israel? If this is the day that you are first experiencing the compassion of God, the mercy of God, I want you to pray with me God's words to God. Members of Highlands Community Church, you know exactly what to do. Let's pray. God, I believe that you love the world so much that you gave your one and only son that if I would believe in him, I would not die but have everlasting life. 
I confess that I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I confess that the wages of my sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. I believe you, Jesus, that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and there's no way I can come to God the Father except through you, Jesus. So right here and now, drawn by the Holy Spirit of God, I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. Say, Jesus is Lord out loud right now. Jesus is Lord. And for good measure, type it in the comments too to share your faith. God, I believe that you raised Jesus from the dead. Now, God, let me be saved. Let me be saved. Let me be saved in Jesus.